You are listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick, Episode 3, Fats. Be sure to follow us online on Instagram, Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. All right, welcome to The Real Health Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Taylor Crick. And today we are talking to you once again through essential number three, your nutrition, and looking at you know those components of a total food makeover. Today we're talking in particular about fats. And fat is probably the most misunderstood topic that there is in nutrition because what do people still tend to, tend to think is that fat makes you fat or that eating fat, dietary fat, foods that are high in fat are going to make you fat. But that is a a huge misconception, Uh, and you can really just look at it from a common sense perspective that, you know, we have more low-fat foods on our shelves than any other country in the world. We have over 15,000 low-fat products, but yet we are the most overweight country in the world. We were the most obese. We just got passed by Mexico, so we're the second most obese. But overall, we are a large nation and really the largest country on earth. Uh, and so if we took fat out of the products, if that would make us lose weight, uh, then we wouldn't be the fattest country. So you can really look at it from that perspective. But really, fat does not make you fat. It's your body's inability to burn fat that makes you fat. Okay, and I'm going to say that again. Fat does not make you fat. Dietary fat does not make you fat. It is your body's inability to burn fat that's going to make you fat. And actually eating healthy fats, eating good fats can help your body. So when you look at what your body uses for fuel, you really have three sources, three what we call macronutrients. And those are sugar, protein, and fat. And carbs, carbs is sugar, you know, carbs, protein, and fat. So from carbs and protein, you get four calories per gram of food. Uh, so that is, you know, that that's just how much energy you get. So if there's 20 grams of, of protein in a protein supplement or something, you're going to get 80 calories from that. Uh, but fat, you actually get twice as much fuel, more than twice as much. You get nine calories per gram. So fat is your body's most efficient fuel source that you can give it. And, you know, one of the things is you're either going to be a sugar burner or you're going to be a fat burner. And a couple of the things that you can think of, a great analogy that I love is, you know, whether or not you're a sugar burner or you're a fat burner, is if you think about your body and your metabolism like a a wood-burning stove, okay? So say you're in a cabin or you live in in an older house, and a wood-burning stove is what you use to heat your house. Well, that's your metabolism, right? Your heat. Well, using your sugar for fuel is kind of like using kindling all the time, okay? So using twigs, using leaves, using your know, newspaper, using things that catch fire really easily, really quickly, good to start a fire. But if that's what you're using to heat your whole house, how often are you going to have to fill that stove? You're going to have to sit there all day and just keep throwing kindling in, give it 10, 15 minutes for that to burn off, and then just keep throwing kindling in. That is a sign that you are a sugar burner. That's what it is like to be a sugar burner. That's why people who are sugar burners, you know, they're always hungry. They graze or they snack all day because they get a little bit, the body burns it off, and then they need more. And then you just keep doing that all day, and it's exactly like the kindling. Well, if your body is a fat burner, then that means that you have efficient metabolism. That is like if you had that wood-burning stove and you threw a big log on there, you know, as big as will fit in and still burn, uh, that's going to give you the longest, the most long-lasting and the most effective results. You know, it's going to heat your house up the most. It's going to last the longest. You're not going to have to keep your eye on it. You know, you could leave that overnight and know that your house is going to be warm because you're using an efficient fuel. And so when you switch your body over from being a sugar burner to a fat burner, you actually make your body more efficient, uh, make your metabolism more efficient, just like that wood burning stove. So a couple of questions that you can ask yourself, you know, are you a sugar burner or are you a fat burner? You know, are you always hungry? Do you snack or do you graze all day? Uh, Do you taste the natural sweetness of a food like an almond. You know, I was eating some almonds the other day and I was just, and I was, you know, preparing for this and thinking about the natural sweetness of almonds. 
and they tasted like candy when you stop and think about it. They're really, really sweet. But, you know, a lot of people, if we're sugar addicts, an almond is just really bland. But when you cut sugar out of your diet, like we talked about in the past uh, podcast episode, you know, go back and listen to the sugar episode because that is the first step is cutting that sugar out of your diet. When you do that, you begin to taste the natural sweetness of other foods. You know, another one is do you have unwanted weight? You know, most people have some unwanted weight around their midsection. And I'm talking, you know, over over 20 pounds. That's a that's a sign that you are a sugar burner rather than a fat burner because your body is storing that fat, storing it up for later, and it's burning off the sugar that you keep feeding it. Uh, another big one, big one, big one is do you experience mood swings? Do you experience crashes? Would you describe yourself as low energy? And you know, some of us, we might not describe ourselves as low energy, but how about this? Would you describe yourself as low energy around three o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, a lot of people, when they switch over from being a sugar burner to being a fat burner, that's one of the biggest things they say is, I'm not getting that mid-afternoon crash. My energy is being sustained all day. Are you chronically stressed? You know, that's a, not a sign really that you're a sugar burner, but stress actually affects your metabolism and affects your insulin through the hormone cortisol and is actually a sign, you know, if you're really stressed, you're more, you have a higher tendency to be a sugar burner. Or are you diabetic or pre-diabetic? You know, that's a, a uh, you're definitely a sugar burner if you are diabetic because you are feeding your body so much sugar that your insulin receptors have begun to burn out. Uh, that's type 2 diabetes. Uh, so, and if you even look at, you know, fat breakdown uh, and, and also your insulin, where your insulin levels are at, where your blood sugar levels are at, there's a certain range where you just aren't breaking down fat once your blood sugar gets too high. So, you have to cut out sugar. Uh, in order to become a fat burner. That is the biggest thing. You know, we're going to talk about good fats versus bad fats, but in order to become a fat burner, you have to cut out sugar. That is the first and the most important thing. Then your body can start using the fuel that you're giving it when you start changing over your good fats or your bad fats to good fats. So when you look at the difference between good fats and bad fats, you know, a general rule of thumb is that, you know, nature doesn't make bad fats factories do. Okay, and so the natural fats are the good fats. Uh, that's like your butter, your coconut oil, your lard, even your avocado oil, your olive oil. Those are natural. And when you look at the bad fats, you're looking at these oils, especially oils. Changing your oils is the number one thing we're going to talk about today. Uh, canola oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, corn oil. And you might think, you know, uh, these weren't made in a factory. You know, factories don't make sunflowers. Factories don't make soybeans. But when you look at these oils and the way that they're processed, they're heavily, heavily processed, and they actually become rancid. And canola, you know, that's a good example of one of the most commonly used oils. But you know, how many of you have a canola plant growing in your backyard? Uh, none of you, because that's an acronym. It stands for Canadian Oil Low Acid. It actually comes from the rapeseed, which is highly genetically modified. So is soybean, highly genetically modified, corn also. So you want to stay away from these bad fats. And so when you look at the bad fats, starting with, with those, the worst are the hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils. Okay, and so that's cottonseed oil, soybean oil, anything that says vegetable oil, those are bad. Those are trans fats and they're and you can uh, you can actually flip over your label and look for those. So anything that says hydrogenated, hydrogenated cottonseed oil, partially hydrogenated soybean oil, look for those words and look for those as red flags. One of the things with trans fats that you have to be careful about is there are loopholes in the labeling that if you're just looking on the outside of the package, it might say zero grams of trans fat and they're allowed to put that on there, but you flip it over and look at the ingredients and you'll see partially hydrogenated vegetable oil or some ingredient like that because if it's under a certain percentage or a certain weight you know per serving size a certain grams per serving size they can put that it contains no trans fat even though it's a, a you know straight up lie um, you have to be able to read your labels you have to flip it over and you have to be good at reading your labels just like we talked about with sugar you want to know what the hidden sources are for these rancid fats uh, some other ones, other trans fat sources, margarines, synthetic butters, and, and, you know, corn oil, canola oil, or those, you know, simply labeled vegetable oil, 
those are the ones that you want to cut out and eliminate. So the first thing, the first step that you want to do is cut that out in your home. So just don't buy it. Uh, even if you have it, don't. Sometimes we'll tell you, you know, use it until it's gone and then don't buy it again. Don't even use it till it's gone. Dump it out. You've got Crisco, you've got Pam Spray, uh, you've got vegetable oil, your Wesson or whatever the vegetable oil brands are. Throw them out today. Get them rid of them in your own home. That's the first step because you know you don't want to be consciously putting that stuff in your body. Uh, incredibly linked to heart disease, to inflammation, to even cellular congestion. Um, but you want to get rid of them in your own home. The second thing is is you watch where you're getting them from other sources. You know because these are found in practically every bread, cracker, cookie. Uh, chips or boxed food, you know, and, and flip it over and look at your label. And if you're following the podcast and you've heard us talk about sugar, you're eliminating those things anyway. You're getting rid of the grains anyway because they're inflammatory and they still affect your insulin and your blood sugar. So you shouldn't be eating those things anyway. But if you're listening to this fats podcast, haven't heard of the sugar podcast, you want to get rid of anything that's pretty much boxed. Uh, every bread, cracker, cookie, chip, anything like that for several, several reasons. And today we're talking about because of the rancid vegetable oils that are in there. The third thing is watch where you're getting it from, you know, restaurants, because you can ask restaurants what they prepare their food in, what kind of oils they prepare their food in, and they will tell you. Uh, And so there's some help more health conscious, uh, you know, restaurants that are starting to use better oils because they know how important it is. And they know that people are asking and people are caring. So that's the first step is get rid of those bad oils. Eliminate those completely uh, and then start adding in your good oils. So when you look at your oils and what is a good oil, um, you, what you want to look at are the stability. You know How stable is the oil? And so one thing to look at you know, just uh, that you can see with the stability is what state is it in at room temperature. So like a couple of the things that are in that are solid at room temperature, or, you know, coconut oil is solid at room temperature, and butter, solid at room temperature. Those are two of the more stable oils. That's why they're solid at room temperature. Uh, so coconut oil is a great one to cook with. Coconut oil has a high flash point, and it is a great oil to cook with. Um, so you can switch out you know, any of your old cooking oils and just use coconut oil, coconut oil for everything. There are so many uses for coconut oil. We'll have a podcast in the future talking about just all the uses for coconut oil because we keep it in our kitchen, you know, right next to our stove to cook to cook everything with. Um, but then you can use it as a teeth whitener. You can use it as a lotion or moisturizer. You know, we use it on our, uh, we have uh, seven month old twin babies and coconut oil is the only thing that's ever been put on their skin. Uh, you can use it as it's a natural uh, disinfectant and antimicrobial. So I know you know you can swallow it um, if you're getting a sore throat or getting a tickle in there. You can do oil pulling, which pulls toxins out of your teeth and can clean your teeth and lead to increased oral hygiene, which can lead to all kinds of awesome health benefits. Um, but coconut oil is great. That's a staple. That's definitely a staple that should be in everybody's kitchen and probably a little bit a little thing of it in everybody's bathroom. And maybe even a little thing of it, you know, in every every woman's purse or every man's desk or something, you know, chapstick, uh, dry hands, anything. You can also use fractionated coconut oil. That is not going to leave uh, the the slime, you know, the not slime. That's a bad word, but you know, the the moisture that's left over after the coconut oil, the shine, more like it. Fractionated coconut oil will be absorbed into the skin a little bit better, so you can use that as a carrier oil for essential oils. You know, so like putting a lavender oil. Uh, you can put it in fractionated coconut oil as a carrier oil and then rub it, for example, like on the bottom of a baby's feet and helps calm them down at night. Um, so you can get fractionated coconut oil too, but that's that's a big one. That's awesome. Another one that is a staple that a lot of people use and are familiar with is olive oil. One thing with olive oil is you do want to be careful when you're cooking with it. It is not as stable as coconut oil. So it is not a good thing to cook with at high temperature. So at a lower temperature, you're doing a light saute. It's perfect. Uh, but otherwise, I would stick with olive oil, drizzling it on your salads, drizzling it on your, uh, your, you know, your raw vegetables that you're snacking on. Putting it in your hummus is a great way. Uh, you know, We use olive oil pretty, um, I don't know what's the opposite of conservative, pretty liberally, um, and we never cook with it. So there's definitely plenty of ways to use it. 
Um, so keep that around. Another good one is avocado oil. That's got a high flash point, another good one to, to cook with. Um, so you can experiment with your oils and see what you like. Uh, but you want to change these healthy fats and change your oils first because you're getting the most exposure to those oils. And if you look at, uh, we have a, a good fats food pyramid. So we have different uh, good fats that you should add into your diet. And just like the USDA food pyramid, which you'll hear us talk about is pretty upside down, you can look at a good fats food pyramid. And what you want to start with at the bottom, start with your oils because you're getting a lot of those. Uh, you want to start with your animal products too because those are an incredibly good source of good fats. Now, when we talk about our good fats, one thing we want to talk about, getting rid of trans fats, changing the oils, but we want to talk about the type of fat too. So when you look at the type of fat, there are polyunsaturated, there are monounsaturated, there are saturated fats, there are unsaturated, there, there are, um, oh, what else is there? They're medium chain, they're long chain, they're short chain, there are all kinds of different fat types. And we're going to break those down in another episode, what the difference and what the definition is of all those fats. But when you start off, the things that you can change the most, you know, starting adding in things like olives, like avocados, different snacks, different things like almonds, uh, but then your meat products changing from pasture or from conventionally raised meat rather, changing over to grass-fed meat. That is the most important step that you can make for your good fats and for increasing your fat burning is actually changing over your animal products to grass-fed beef. So tune in for the next episode to hear about the difference between the omega-3s and the omega-6s and why grass-fed beef is so much better. But grass-fed beef is literally going to kickstart your body's metabolism, give it the fuel that it needs to become a fat burner. And because you're taking in you know, more of it, it's one of the top sources of fats, one of the top sources of protein, you're going to want to change that first. Also, the other reason we want to change our animal products first, this is incredibly important, is because of that thing that we learned about in grade school called the food chain. So you are what you eat and you are what they ate too. So does that make sense? So a cow, if you're looking at beef, you're looking at a cow that's fed grains that turn to sugar, just like in a human, that cow is going to get fatter quicker, which is a good thing for a farmer. But it's a bad thing for that cow. That cow is going to get fat, going to get sick. And so then they're going to need to pump it full of antibiotics, pump it full of hormones. And it also alters the fat ratios in omega-3 and omega-6 fats. So there's a lot of bad things happening with conventionally raised meat that are actually going to sabotage your health. So if you are in a position where you can't afford to change over your meat, that's where I would recommend cutting out meat products or limiting them if you can afford to go at least organic uh, at the, and also grass-fed with your beef. Same thing with free-range chicken, wild-caught fish. That's another good source. You know, your omega-3 fats are high in salmon, your cold water uh, fish like a fresh or like a, a wild-caught salmon. You don't want it to be farm-raised. But so at the bottom of this good fats pyramid, are those things that we're talking about. Some of the some of the meat products, some of the butter, the uh, animal products, olives, avocado, salmon, some of the good long chain saturated fats, and some of the mono unsaturated fats at the bottom. Then the next one up are some of the saturated fats, the coconut products. So you have heard for years probably that saturated fats are bad for you. Well, that myth has been debunked. So saturated fats are actually necessary for every function in your body. And or for your body's survival, I should say. They're necessary not for every single function, but they're necessary for your survival. You would die without saturated fats in your diet, and you get them the best source of them is from the animal products, but also from our coconut products. So coconut milk, coconut oil, like we talked about. There's now coconut aminos or coconut flakes. There's even coconut sugar, which we want to stay away from because it's still a sugar, but there's tons of coconut products that are really good fast fuel source for your body. So post-workout, you know, if you're an athlete, coconut products are one of the best. They're the fastest fuel source for your body to replenish its fuel after it's burned it off. Then at the very top of the of the fat pyramid, uh, the thing that we want to take in, you know, the least after we're filling in those foundational levels, then we want to get to our polyunsaturated fats, our PUFAs, which are omega-3s and omega-6s. Now, omega-3s, are the ones that we have heard 
the most about, right? In the news or in the articles that we read, we hear a lot about omega threes and their, you know, cardioprotective properties, protect against heart disease, protect against inflammation. But omega sixes are equally as important. They are inflammatory, so you want to decrease your omega sixes. But you are, you know, it is something that's necessary. You still want, you can't eliminate omega sixes. You have to have them in your life. But you need to decrease those while increasing your omega threes. So that's by switching to things like like salmon, um, switching to things like nuts, seeds, you know, some of your meat products even too are high in the omega-3s, flaxseed, chia seed, you know, some plant-based sources of omega-3s, boosting up those omega-3s that actually help fight inflammation, and then decreasing your omega-6s, and that's what you're getting a lot in your bad vegetable oils and in your bad meat. So decrease those conventionally raised meat. That's going to take down your inflammatory omega-6s and increase your omega-3. So if you can do those action steps, so just another recap. First step to becoming a fat burner, first step is cutting out sugar. You got to cut out what your body is using for fuel. You got to start throwing those big logs on the fire. So then you want to cut out your bad fats, decrease your bad fats by changing your oils, changing your oils first off, and then looking at where you're getting these bad fats in the foods that you're eating that you're buying, you know, from a restaurant or from a a grocery store, getting rid of those bad fats. Then the last step, the most important step, throw those big logs on the fire, Uh, start eating the good fats, start eating more wild-caught salmon, more avocados, more almonds, more cashews, more grass-fed meat products, and especially more coconut products. So if you start doing those action steps, the first thing that you'll notice is an energy change. The second thing that you'll notice is that your clothes will start fitting differently. That actually happens before the scale really even starts moving. The clothes will start to change differently because your body is starting to burn fat. Then you will notice you're starting to lose weight and inches. When you start to switch your body over from being a sugar burner to a fat burner, it starts to burn the fat that it has stored on your midsection, and it starts to use that for fuel, starts to burn those big logs, keep that house warm, and stoke that metabolism. So make sure you stay tuned next time. We're going to talk more about these fats and really the science behind the fats, the different types of fats, and what it means. What does saturated fat mean? What does polyunsaturated fat mean? What is omega-3? What is omega-6? How can I know where I stand with these fats? Can it be measured? And which ones should I be increasing? Which ones should I be decreasing? So stay tuned next time as we get into some more details on fats. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Taylor Crick with The Real Health Podcast. I'm looking forward to next time and maximize your lives. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.